Good afternoon to everybody and thank you all for coming. This is a very exciting time for us at WashDOT and for the City of Seattle. We're here today to talk about the opening of the SR-99 tunnel. It's been a project that's been 20 years in the works in planning and construction and we're here today to tell you that the tunnel is going to open in early 2019. Last year, as Seattle Tunnel Partners, WashDOT's contractor that constructed the tunnel, was finishing the tunnel and taking Bertha, the tunnel boring machine, out of the ground, they were forecasting an early 2019 opening. There's been a lot of optimism over the last year or so that we could achieve that opening date as early as this fall. But working with our partners at the City of Seattle, King County Metro, Sound Transit, and the Port, we've decided that an early 2019 date is what's going to be best for the City of Seattle and the community at large. Prior to opening the tunnel to traffic, we're going to have to close Highway 99 for a period of about three weeks. That closure will start on January 11th. Prior to opening the, I'm sorry, prior to beginning the tunnel, prior to starting the SR-99 closure, we're going to have to close one off-ramp. That's the off-ramp from southbound Highway 99 at Atlantic Street, the one that takes folks to the stadiums. That has to close about a week before the SR-99 closure. So to stay out of the holiday season, we're going to start the full closure of the SR-99 on January 11th. With the date of the Highway 99 closure determined in early January, we need the public to start thinking about that now. This closure is going to be a long-term major closure of a major route in, high, in Seattle. And folks need to start thinking now about what their alternative transportations are going to be. As we prepare for this closure, washed out and our partner agencies are planning and taking actions to prepare the roadway and the system for those closures. For example, WashDOT will be coordinating in real time with SDOT, Seattle Department of Transportation, and with the transit agencies to manage traffic and identify the pinch points and, and inform the public on how to maneuver best through the closure. WashDOT will be adding to our system additional incident response teams so that if incidents occur, crashes in the roadway, we can clear them as soon as possible. WashDOT will have the southbound HOV lanes on I-5 through Seattle open to all traffic during the closure period. And WashDOT will be staffing our traffic management center at in shoreline with additional traffic engineers so if we can identify uh, traffic operation improvements that we can make on the fly we'll have the resources available to plan and execute those with me today are representatives from seattle department of transportation king county metro and the port of seattle and right now i'm going to ask heather marks with the seattle department of transportation to talk a little bit about their plans Thank you so much, Brian, and thank everyone for being here. So the way that we get around in Seattle is about to change forever. And things are a lot different than when I moved here uh, in 1995. Everything is different. We are on the cusp of becoming that world-class city that we've always dreamed of. So over the past several uh, years, actually, we've been working with WashDOT and King County Metro and the Port of Seattle to make sure that we're prepared for this day and now it's almost here. So during the permanent viaduct closure, the Seattle Department of Transportation is going to be doing a number of things to make sure that the traveling public can get around during that time of restriction. Um, our Transportation Operations Center is gonna be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's where we monitor traffic, uh, traffic situations through our cameras and other data collection advice, uh, devices. That's where we can change signal timing on the fly if we need to. That's where we can help keep 
uh, the Seattle Police Department and the Fire Department engaged. We're going to be in constant contact with uh, our friends at Metro and our friends at WashDOT to make sure that things are moving along as well as they can. Um, in addition, we have just opened up an API with um, some mapping services, so Google, TomTom, others, um, to make sure that they have our construction and traffic information. Um, the idea there is that they won't be routing folks into a hole in the ground. Um, we are also going to um, engage in some temporary parking restrictions to make sure um, that we have maximum uh, capacity for um, all the vehicles to, to be traveling. In addition, we're going to be modifying or revoking certain construction permits just during this period of time so that we can maximize the space available. Um, in addition, we are, the City of Seattle is going to um, station uniformed police officers at key intersections uh, to make sure particularly that transit can keep moving. The, the thing that I really want to focus on right now, though, is that this is the first stage in a five-year period that we're calling the period of maximum constraint. This is going to be a series of events that take place between now and 2023 that are going to completely shift the way we get around. So first we have the viaduct closing, the tunnel opening, the viaduct is going to be demolished. We have historic levels of construction throughout the city. Um, next year, uh, in March, all of the buses that travel in the downtown Seattle Transit Tunnel will be coming to the surface. So your Department of Transportation is fully engaged in making sure that all of that is going to happen in the best way possible. And I just also want to say that change is really hard, but we're all in this together. I live in West Seattle. I commute downtown for work. And we're all going to have to be flexible and engaged because at the end, we're going to have a transportation system that really works for you. I'd like to turn it over to Jerry Poor, who is from the Port of Seattle, who's going to talk a little bit about what they're doing. Thank you, Heather. The Port of Seattle is so pleased to be at this point in the process with our partners. And planning is already underway at the port. Regarding our container terminals, we've developed new procedures and systems at the truck gates to alleviate the morning queues entering the terminals. Regarding freight haulers on the city streets, we've been communicating closely for several months, and all freight traffic will have access to a freight-only route from Alaskan Way to East Marginal Way to keep First Avenue South less congested during the closure. Our port police will be on duty and available to help with port traffic flows if requested, and out at the airport, we'll alert airport users with signage and updates. And throughout the port, we're developing strong employee Port Employee Commute Alternatives programs, promoting transit, rideshare, and alternative work arrangements. I'll now turn this over to Terry White, the Deputy General Manager at King County Metro. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, King County Metro has been working with the state through two previous viaduct closures over the past couple of decades. With this milestone now in sight, it's time to close the viaduct permanently, and we're ready to shift bus service to new pathways and to help people move together. Once the viaduct closes, riders should plan for and expect weeks of travel delays on all buses coming to and through the downtown Seattle areas. First, we expect the delays to affect the 12 routes that will be rerouted off the viaduct permanently. Second, we expect delays to spread throughout the bus system, starting with the CBD and moving outward. We're asking people to be ready, and if possible, work with your employers to help you with flex scheduling, telecommuting options. Consider ways to share rides and van pools and car carpools, and obviously return to Metro for assistance. If you want to leave your car at home and try riding Metro, please test the mass transit system prior to this event occurring. In recent years, Metro in partnership with Seattle has taken steps to expand bus service to address current crowding and demands. While this has opened up more seats, they can quickly fill again. Recognizing that there is no single solution that will work for everyone, and with gridlock expected to affect the region, we're asking for everyone to be prepared for major service delays and consider how you can best avoid them. 
When the viaduct closes, our 12 routes that use this corridor will instead shift to streets in the Soto area and will have longer travel times. We're finalizing the stops currently that will serve and we will post them online shortly. These routes equate to 600 bus trips carrying 30,000 boardings a day. And they all use 3rd down, Third Avenue in downtown Seattle. And that's good news. Because Seattle has just expanded the transit-only hours on 3rd Avenue last month. Now those hours are 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, prior to that, they were just during the rush hours, 6 to 9, and 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Metro also is exploring the availability of more than a dozen standby coaches to help keep riders moving. Adding these buses will help maintain posted schedules and they'll be deployed where needed throughout the region, most likely to face delays and overloads due to the viaduct closure. Metro staff will monitor services 24-7 through our transit control center. Uh, as a situations change, we will adjust on the fly to ensure that we have adequate services out there for the customers. We also appreciate Seattle's work to post police officers to help ensure buses filled with hundreds of riders can work their way through the gridlock. Metro carries 400,000 riders per day, and we appreciate everyone's efforts to keep bus service moving. We've been preparing. We ask everyone else to also prepare and look forward to seeing this project reach this important milestone. I'll turn it over to Paul Brodeur, King County Marine Division Director, who will explain the accidents plan for the water taxi. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an exciting announcement today. So, as many of you know, the water taxi provides a popular commute option when roads are gridlocked. Building on lessons from the 2016 viaduct closure, we served, the water taxi served as a congestion-free way of getting in and out of the city. We've seen that in previous closures. We've seen that when trucks overturn on I-5. People turn to the water taxi as a way to get back to West Seattle in the evenings. On August 2nd, uh, 11th, we ran a uh, two-boat service for the Sub Pop Festival and carried a record number of riders that day, over 7,600 riders. So what's our action plan for the closure, you might ask? Well, we plan on operating a two-vessel service to West Seattle. That's not only going to add capacity, it's going to add frequency. We'll have trips leaving West Seattle during the commute hours every 20 minutes, same going home in the evening. Metro will double up on their shuttles on the Route 773 and 775. Again, adding that frequency, feeding the water taxi from points up at the junction and along Alki. We're also working with our partners at the Port of Seattle for a park and float. This will be a parking lot at Pier 2, which is about six-tenths of a mile from Seacrest Park, and we will run dedicated shuttles to that location during the commute hours to get people to and from their vehicle and onto the water taxi. Also working with our partners at SDOT, we're working on uh, freeing up some all-day parking availability additional spots along Harbor Avenue, which will allow customers to more easily access the water taxi for those that are driving. Van pools and TNCs will be looking at staging at Don Armini Park, which is a short walk to Seacrest Park from there. Working with our partners at Seattle Parks for additional bike uh, capacity at Seacrest Park so folks can access the water taxi with their bicycles and leave their bike in West Seattle uh, in a secured way. We also do carry bicycles on the water taxis, but I know from the last closure, bike capacity gets full pretty quickly. We would encourage our new riders, folks ass accessing the water taxi for the first time, to get familiar with our service ahead of, ahead of this closure and uh, to determine the best form of payment uh, to be able to uh, speed up the processing at the boarding location. And we do accept ORCA, which makes it very easy for those that have the uh, ORCA pass. So we encourage, again, all new riders and even frequent riders, plan ahead, plan your commute, get there early, be patient, and we will get you across the water safely and reliably. Thank you. Thank you all. Do you want to move a little closer?
Um, and we can open it up for questions now. I hope you can see how much planning has gone into this. Can we ask, when will the tunnel actually open? The tunnel is expected to open around uh, the first week or so of February 2019. Can you walk us through the decisions here? I mean, how did you make the decision to push this back to January? So I, I want to be sure people understand it's always been our plan to open the tunnel in early 2019. We were... Uh, pushing for opportunities to be able to open as early as this fall, but those opportunities just didn't come to fruition. There's a great deal of coordination that has to happen for this for the tunnel to open to traffic, both completion of work from washdot contractors. Uh, as you heard today, all of the agencies are preparing for and planning to do a number of different operational changes within the system. So we needed all of those things to line up and uh, also, we were really concerned about the risk of having this closure going on during the holiday season. And as the fall days quickly begin to wane and uh, it was pushing our, our, our window of opportunity for the closure was pushing further into the fall, we didn't want to take the weather risk of having this major weather sensitive work going on as we pushed up close to the holidays. So in the end, again, washed out along with our partners decided that all of those things combined, it would be in the best interest of the public if we put the closure off to our, onto our original schedule of January or early 2019. You had the, uh, you had the incident during functional testing a few weeks ago where you had kind of a pressurization issue blow out. Was that a factor? Were there other failures during integrated testing that contributed to this? No, the testing and commissioning of the tunnel by Seattle Tunnel Partners has been going very well. They're in the range of 70 to 80 percent complete with the last set, uh, portion of testing that they need to do. The incident a couple of weeks ago um, was an incident for sure. Seattle Tunnel Partners has developed the fix for that and uh, testing is continuing so that wasn't a major contributor to this decision. So if it hadn't been for the holidays, would you just have sort of rolled this back? I mean, is that the critical decision point here? You need to either you couldn't get it done before, but so now you're going to go after it to sort of clear. The, the commitment to not have this major closure during the holiday season is, has always been in washed out in the city of Seattle's mind, so that was one of the factors for sure. It is weather sensitive work and January isn't the best time of year for construction. The major advantage to January from that perspective is uh, Thanksgiving isn't right afterward. We have a little more float on the back end, uh, but our contractor does understand the work and does understand the weather risk and will have contingency plans in place to, to complete the closure as quickly as we can. We expect it to be about three weeks. Uh, yeah, piggybacking on that, have you built in to that three weeks ex the expectation that there are going to be weather delays then to sort of make that a realistic assumption? And we believe the three weeks is a, is a, real, a realistic assumption given the weather. Uh, you talk about six weeks in some of your materials here. You never really, I mean, we know some ramps are going to be take longer than three weeks. You seem to be emphasizing the potential for six weeks with the disruption. Can you explain that? It sounds like the core of this will be three, but then will the back end, the other three, be worse than what you were sort of originally thinking? Yes, the plan for the closure is to have mainline Highway 99 closed for a period of about three weeks. There is one on ramp, I'm sorry, one off ramp that will close approximately a week before the start of that three week mainline closure. And then there's a ramp, the northbound off ramp, um, south of town that leads into the new intersection at Dearborn and Alaskan Way. That ramp will continue to be closed for a week or perhaps two after the main line opens. To that's travel. part of the original. That's been in the works for a while. So yes. The the ramp, the one week ramp 
closure in advance and the ramp follow-on closure ramp after the mainline closure have always been part of the plan and so the total impact of traffic is in the range of four to six weeks. So the messaging about the six weeks, that sounds like what's been amplified here, even though the facts for the game plan really haven't changed. The plan has always been for about a three-week mainline closure with the one ramp extending after that closure for up to two weeks, yes. What is this due to the uh, demolition schedule for the bike? Are you going to be able to get it done before the tourist season next uh, summer? We'll be evaluating the impacts of the demolition schedule with that contractor. Their previous uh, expected completion for demolition was May. I expect that will be later, and we don't have a date yet. When will it start? The demolition will start uh, very shortly after the tunnel opens to traffic, so it should be in February 2019. Did you guys uh, consult with uh, football officials at UW and Seahawks, and what role did they play, if any, in this decision? We coordinate all our major closures with uh, event planners all over the city, and certainly the major league teams are, and the college teams are some of those event planners. Um, it's been a it's been a continuing effort to plan the work, and I don't know that any particular event contributed did, more significantly to did, this decision. Did you specifically talk to them about the advantage of waiting? No. The, and when you say that the agencies decided together to wait till January, are you, are you talking about the? Uh, six people standing here or, were there, or was there did the mayor or the transportation secretary uh, uh, intervene any lawmakers or electeds we've been coordinating this planning effort uh, and all the way up to the secretary of transportation and he was communicating with his counterparts at the executive level and the agencies if it were not for the restrictions the holiday restrictions when would you be ready to do this The holidays are a very important time for, for downtown Seattle and certainly for the Seattle retailers. So we wanted to be respectful of the need to have a productive holiday season, so that's always been in our minds in this planning effort. When did you make the decision, when did you make the call that you're going to have to go into 2019 over pre Thanksgiving The final decision on the... Um, on the start date for the SR99 closure was made late last week. One uh, physical question about the, the detours. You've got fresh pavement and four-lane road right out here. Um, is that going to extend all the way north by January 11th? And how far north uh, does that uh, roadbed go? Yes, we're in the process of doing a traffic switch on Alaskan Way. Currently, that traffic is underneath the viaduct, and we will shift it out to Alaskan Way proper. That shift is expected to occur in mid-October, in a few weeks. And that uh, lane configuration will be two through lanes from King Street to north of Pike. What's the uh, substantial completion forecast right now from STP? The last schedule we received for them had a uh, forecast substantial completion date of October 1st. So I'm just trying to get a sense, I mean, the project isn't just going to be kind of sitting around then until January, is it, between October and, and, and uh, January? No, there is still work to be done in the tunnel. Seattle Tunnel Partners is continuing with their testing and commissioning. They have uh, punch list work to do in the tunnel. If we had accelerated the work, it would be likely they would be having to perform some of that punch, li punch list work under lane closures at night. So this will give an opportunity to have the Seattle Tunnel Partner contract completely done before we open the tunnel to traffic. It's also an opportunity for us to continue uh, our work with our maintenance and operations folks as they get very familiar with the operations of the tunnel and continue to advance their use and familiarity with the tunnel operating systems. Once the tunnel opens in February and demolition begins on the viaduct, will the Im traffic impacts of that be limited to Alaskan Way or will that bleed over and uh, cause further traffic impacts around downtown? 
I'm sorry, I missed the first part of your question. Once you open the tunnel and begin demolition on the, of the old viaduct, how will those traffic impacts, uh, you know, how far will those reverberate? Yeah, it is important to note that when the SR-99 tunnel opens the traffic, it's going to be a new transportation system in Seattle. People that are used to traveling on the viaduct have opportunities to exit at the midtown ramps into downtown. The new tunnel is a direct route from the stadiums to the Space Needle. So there's definitely going to be a period of weeks and perhaps months of a shakeout period as people learn their new commute patterns. We do, the tunnel will open toll free in early 2019. So as people learn their, their new commute patterns, as we continue with demolition of the viaduct, uh, there will continue to be changes in, that, in those commute patterns throughout next year and beyond. As Heather mentioned, this period of maximum constraint is going to continue for a period of time. What's the projection for the tolls? The, the State Transportation Commission is actually setting those tolls. They're planning to set those tolls next month. They will be in the range of one dollar to two and a quarter. No, sorry, the date, the starting date. I'm sorry, the starting date for tolls is not de yet determined. It's expected to be uh, in 2019. A uh, couple of bus questions: Is the is the down is the the uh, private watchdog supported downtown shuttle going to be operating through this period? And uh, for Metro, is there any medium-term or long-term uh, effort to design a, a tunnel bus? As far as designing routes, we, we have our planners and schedulers that continuously are looking to improve our system on a regular basis. So we will certainly assess uh, through some data and probably working with the customers and our riders and, and uh, bus drivers to figure out what we'll do next. Our goal is always to make the system as efficient as possible. And the, the waterfront shuttle, what's happening with that? Uh, my assumption is the waterfront taxi. So at this time, WASDOT is funding through its parking mitigation program a waterfront shuttle that runs between the Space Needle and Pioneer Square. Currently that shuttle is funded through about the middle of next year. So it's going to run, oh, so you're not even going to take a fall hiatus from that, it's just going to keep going? We're still evaluating with our partners on whether we'll run that continuously or whether we will take a fall or winter hiatus. But are you going to run it? Uh, are you going to run it on January 12th? Not yet determined. What are the changes to the cost of the project? Washdot um, made a projection to the legislator last year, I believe, that we felt we could finish the. Uh, program for $149 million, and I believe that's still the case. Well, you've got a pretty good group here, but we're selling trains. Well, Kimberly's here. Would you oh. like to talk to her? three-car peak service trains at capacity, so we'll be working closely with WashDOT to maintain that, that high capacity service during peak service, and then um, we'll be as responsive as we can during non-peak hours. What we're also working to do with all of our partners is to get the message out to anyone who's using public transit that, yes, we have transit options, they will be crowded. Trains and buses are crowded now. We don't want to, you know, mislead people into thinking that you're going to be able just to get on a train and, and have it be um, smooth sailing. It will be a tough time, but we will help people navigate the options that are available. Are you going to, uh, do you have the options of uh, borrowing or leasing additional equipment, be they buses or rail cars for sound? Or we do not have resources to lease additional equipment. Uh, or will there be any... Uh, Restrictions on, on bicycles or any other customer, low restrictions to deal with tax trains? 
Um, that is a consideration. There hasn't been any decision made on whether we would do that, but it's a conversation we are having based on the fact that the trains will be extra crowded as well as the buses. Are, are there any escalator or elevator reforms uh, that you can do between now and then? We're working on that hard, and we'll be getting out more information uh, later on this fall on that. I have a question for Mr. Brodier. Uh, whether the water taxi during the closure period, besides the double, the two boat service you mentioned, will you be running seven days a week then, or just five days? This will be a Monday through Friday a.m. and p.m. commute service. So the uh, five day a week service will still be the thing since it'll be yes. winter. Okay. Thank Our you. Winter schedule, Tracy. Oh, is that only the three weeks then, or is that going to be for six weeks? Um, we're going to evaluate it certainly during that three-week cr critical time and make that kind of neat game time decision, but we will be prepared to run it uh, for the full six weeks if necessary. Well, the, uh, the Atlantic, the Atlantic uh, part of the interchange, uh, that'll be done, that that will be ready after the three weeks, right? The, the, uh, you're going to get a head start on it, the Atlantic off-ramp southbound. The question is, will, will people be able to get from the stadiums to southbound 99 uh, right away when the tunnel opens, or do they have to wait for the earthquake uh, proof overpass uh, that goes above them or near them? When the SR99 tunnel opens to traffic after the mainline closure period, all ramps will be open with the one exception of the northbound off ramp to Dearborn. How about during the, the three week? Uh, transition period will be able, will you be able to get out of Soto using Atlanta Street 299? No, during the mainline closure period, Highway 99 will be closed from West Seattle Bridge to the south end of the Battery Street Tunnel. And will folks be able to use just the Battery Street Tunnel to loop out at the Western Avenue exit during the, the three weeks? The plan is to maintain one lane of traffic through the Battery Street Tunnel so that folks can continue to do the on, use the on and off ramps at Western.